to the next part. And now we're sort of going this way. Now that we have Maxwell equations, let's have our wave equation that's going to dictate what's going to happen as it propagates. Let's clearly, uh, quickly show the self and cross phase modulation and parametric frequency mixing uh, in this scenario. And then we're going to actually solve a few experimental configurations. So look at those experiments and see what, what happens at the output of the waveguide. Okay, so Maxwell equations, right there. Nothing new here. And over here, the only difference we add now the term that matters from the nonlinear polarization. Okay? And I'm writing my waveguide. This is Z, the propagation along the waveguide. X and Y are the transverse uh, coordinates. And it's characterized by a certain um, refractive index profile, N of X and Y. Whatever it is. And then I think on Friday, you're going to have the courses on um, COMSOL that you will plug in this. One of the things you're going to do using the finite element, you're going to plug in this and calculate the eigen modes of this waveguide. Calculate the field distribution for a certain frequency and the effective index. Okay? So we assume now that you have that information. If we do not have PNL, then that's what we do. You calculate the eigen modes and all of that. Now we have P and L, and um, we need to, um, to work. So the uh, wave equation is simple, right? So we take the uh, cross product of this equation, and then this is going to be cross of B. B is uh, me 0 times H, so this is going to be second derivative of D minus. So that's what we got here. That's the basic wave equation. And, uh, but the problem now is that D is, um, has the nonlinear contribution as well. Um, <clears throat> the way we solve this is now is slightly different. And the, the method we're going to use is this slowly varying envelope approximation. It's VF. And I'm going to write the field once again in the Fourier domain. That's always how we do it. But there is a little catch here. The polarization we already know. It has all those terms from our menu. The field is what we want to know. And I add them also in a free expansion. But the amplitude is now written this way right here. I have A that depends on Z. That's the amplitude of the field. And a spatial profile right here, plus the phase factor. And uh, I'm just going to write this as a ej. ej is right here. Small e is the eigen mode. Is the solution of the waveguide when there is no nonlinear polarization. For example, in an optical fiber, it's sort of a Gaussian field distribution, okay? In a rectangular waveguide, you will see, you have some examples later here, you have the field, a certain distribution. So think about this as the field distribution that uh, propagates along the waveguide without changing when it's a linear material. And A, is an amplitude that is going to vary along the length. For example, third harmonic generation. We can have a situation in which A oscillating at 3 omega was zero at the input, but it gets generated as it propagates through. Okay? So that's the idea. A represents what is it that I'm generating at frequency omega? What is it that I'm changing about frequency omega? Either if it is already present at the input, or if it's not and it gets generated, or if it is and it gets the phase modulated, what, what's, what's happening as it propagates. But the shape of the mode remains the same. Okay? So we need to plug in this 
into here or the sum into there. And uh, you see that we're going to, because we're writing as a, as a um, harmonic, um, once we plug harmonics on this side and then harmonics on that side, the equations get decoupled, right? Separated. So I'm going to solve for one harmonic and then another harmonic and then another harmonic. Do you see what I'm saying? Let's say it again. So if I plug in this E on this side, on that side, um, I'm basic, basically going to separate the equations for each frequency. Ooh, let's see what we get. Very well. There's my wave equation again. I did nothing but to plug in that into the electric field. And the same thing over here. Uh, you can manipulate this equation. And here's another homework. Mark a star there. So you guys can do that. This equation can be manipulated, not very difficult, to that equation right there. I know it's an ugly equation to look at, but the terms are very quickly we're going to identify what they are and simplify the scenario. From here to here, homework. Part of the, don't we have a test? Or uh, we do have a test, right? For this Gustavo and Tiago. So there is a uh, question number one. Uh, now look at those terms. The very first approximation that we do is this. We throw away, we're physicists, right? We're not mathematicians. So whatever is second order, this is going to go away. So slowly variant amplitude means all second order derivatives of the amplitude we're going to ignore. So physically this means the evolution of the amplitude is slow compared to the wavelength, okay? All right, so we throw that away. Plus, there's a second part. If I had P omega 1 equal to 0, the eigenmode satisfies the wave equation without the nonlinear polarization. And that's exactly those terms right there. Oops, this arrow should be here, sorry. I don't know what happened. So this term is what I have here. And then this term is what I have here, all multiplied by A. Now it becomes much simpler. Okay? Okay, guys, you have these lights. This is going to be available. So don't worry too much about uh, copying it. But this is still tricky, right? You see, you have the cross product here, and then curl, and then you, this, is, this is not good. Um, Another simple manipulation, curl of E. We can use Maxwell equation again. This is the eigenmode and turn that into H. So we eliminate the curl. There you go. It's getting even simpler, right? Almost pretty. Not quite, but there. But I still have a cross product here. And what we can do is we can use the orthogonality, orthogonality relation of the electromagnetic fields. Um, and remembering that in this notation that we have, E, complex conjugate cross H dot Z, this is the pointing vector, and this is simply the power that is being carried by that mode. Okay? So we multiply this side by E complex conjugate, multiply that side by E complex conjugate, integrate over the waveguide cross section. That's where this integration happens. And that's what I did here. Recognize that this is the power carried by that mode. And now we have an equation that is much simpler. So it's a first order equation that tells me how the amplitude of the component at frequency omega j um, is going to vary, so the derivative, right, along z. And it depends on this overlap integral here. The integral between the eigenmode profile, so a Gaussian for a fiber, and the profile of the polarization that we calculated before. 
So you see over here, you have to know those profiles in order to do this. And so once again, you, you, you can link the, 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 the classes you're going to have. It comes all again, you calculate the profiles, and this is going to give you a, a term that you plug in in this equation, and then you solve it. All right? <clears throat> well, so let's just start our virtual experiments. I get one laser, and I focus on my waveguide, and it propagates. It could be, again, a fiber, whatever it is. So I have a single frequency. Therefore, I'm just calculating, solving that equation for AP, which I call pump. That's my laser. So from my menu, remember we talked about which terms oscillate at omega P if I have only a single frequency. Um, and that's the only term that we have. That was the term of cell phase modulation. And uh, since we haven't solved the mode yet, using COMSOL or whatever, uh, we're going to just assume. This is my spatial profile here. Um, and I calculate the power, what it is, it becomes the integral of this function squared. Uh, the power of that's carried is going to be simply the modulus of AP squared times N. And I just substitute this into this equation. And if you do that, that's what you get. And our equation becomes something like this. Now I have the derivative of AP depends on a certain coefficient. This is just a normalization. I know this function can just perform this integral. It's nothing, just a numerical. But now what's interesting is here. The amplitude depends on its own squared modulus multiplied by itself. Okay? Well, keep that. Just a change of parameters now. Get things a little prettier. This equation, you can get all of that and write as gamma. Gamma is the nonlinear coefficient. That's the number we refer to when we compare it to waveguides. So gamma of an optical fiber, regular optical fiber, it's a number, and it's given by watt um, meter all minus one. So a nonlinear fiber, for example, has this number equal to, let's say, 10. So gamma equal to 10. This is one over watt kilometer, for example. And the equation is very simple. Now, the amplitude depends on the derivative of the amplitude is i, the nonlinear coefficient, the power that that mode is carrying, times the amplitude again. The very first thing you see is the square, which gives the power, doesn't change as the wave propagate in length. And you can prove that because you, you make the derivative of this along z, it becomes AP conjugate multiplied by the derivative of A and then the complex conjugate. And so if you add, because this equation is purely imaginary on this side, you add those two, this is zero. So power, which is proportional to the A squared, will not change. Of course, we've had, we have ignored all the, the imaginary parts. Remember, we ignore uh, absorption and linear absorption. So in this scenario, P does not depend on Z. Okay, so it's, the solution is quite simple, right? It's just an explanation. That's what it is. So the solution is then the field, um, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be zero. The field is whatever amplitude we had at the input, if I sent one watt of power in, I'm ignoring attenuation, it continues to be that power, but there is an additional phase Okay, so it is like, not it is like, it is the fact that the wave changes the refractive index it feels. Okay, so it's not the term propagating Z, it's not beta Z anymore. It's beta plus gamma P. If I increase the power, it's equivalent to increasing the refractive index. So this is called cell phase modulation. Okay? 
So we, we, we solved our first example. Let's go to our next example. We're going to get two signals now, and I'm going to go a little faster. And uh, we want to talk, we want to see cross phase modulation. Well, I have two frequencies. And we, I already said from our menu, what are the terms that oscillate um, at omega p or omega s from that nonlinear polarization? We have the cell phase modulation term and the cross phase modulation term. We also have the four wave mixing terms. But for now, I will ignore them. So uh, once again, just write the field as a certain profile, plug in the polarization, and it becomes that. Now the polarization at omega p depends on the power at omega p, so the square input, but also the power on um, omega uh, es, omega s. We do exactly the same manipulation. We get two coupled equations like that, and I just simplified at gamma p equals to gamma l for now. Frequencies are closed. Gamma is proportional to omega. Um, and once again, these equations, the, the, you can also show that the power doesn't, doesn't change along the line. So the lasers, if I have ignored the four-wave mixing terms, um, the power in each laser remains the same as they propagate. And therefore, you only have a f additional phase shift, additional nonlinear phase shift. Once again, you have the, no, the um, cell phase modulation phase shift, but now I have a second two times the power on the other laser. So note that the index, index here um, switches, right? So this is P comma S, P comma S, P comma S, P comma S, now S comma P. So the phase of one laser as it propagates, that phase is influenced by the power on that laser, but also by the power present in the other laser. So I can use one laser to change the phase that uh, another one uh, feels, right? So this can be used for switching, for example. I change the index with another laser. Very well. So finally, the case that we wanted to treat uh, since the beginning, which is the four-wave mixing case. And it's degenerate because I have only um, two frequencies. So all the terms that are non-degenerate, omega 1 plus omega 1 plus omega 1, oh, sorry, 1 plus 2 plus 3, that goes away. We only have the terms that are 2 omega 1 minus omega 2, or 2 omega 2 minus omega 1. Um, this is what's going to happen now in a cartoon sort of. If I input omega 1 and omega p and omega s at the output, we're going to treat the, and this is, I assume this is a strong laser and this is a weak laser. What's going to happen is power from the pump laser is going to be transferred to the signal right here. So it, it, it increases the amplitude compared to what we had before. But in addition to that, we will generate another signal at 2 omega p minus omega s. And that comes out from the equations that we just um, solved. The efficiency in which it goes up, how much do we amplify? And how does it change with the frequency difference? So that's sort of called the gain spectrum. And I just drew a shape here that's one of the typical shapes there. So we can calculate all that now. Hmm. Um, uh, this is just illustrating right, what I just said. Very well. To do that, we follow exactly the same procedure. Write the fields and expansion. We have the modes, each of which, now it's important to know, notice this. Look, I'm saying the spatial profile, the Gaussian distribution in the fiber, is the same, independent on the frequency, because I'm assuming the frequencies are closed. So the field doesn't change much. If it's a Gaussian like that, it's going to be pretty much a Gaussian like that, not much wider, not thinner, not uh, narrower. Um, if I change the frequency a little bit. But what does change is the effective index, the propagation constant. So the propagation constant, um, we can always write as omega over c multiplied by the effective index. The effective index is the eigenvalue of the Maxwell equations when there is no nonlinear polarization. So the phase is different for each mode. 
And this is going to get into the concept of phase matching, which is very important now. Very well. So we write the nonlinear polarization. All the terms. You see what we had before? Oh, there's something I make a mistake here. What's the mistake here? It's not that hard to see. Look, um, I have... I have self-phase modulation. I have cross-phase modulation on omega p due to omega s, but I forgot the term due to omega l. So there should be another plus 2 e omega l. All right? I'll correct that before you get the slides. And then the four-wave mixing terms. And I pick the term from our menu that oscillates at the frequency of that, that, and that. Which term oscillates at the frequency of omega i? Well, that's easy. That's 2 omega p minus omega s, right? So 2 omega p minus omega s gives it right here. So, so uh, these guys are separated by the same frequency distance. The term in um, omega s, 2 omega p minus omega i, and then the term in uh, omega p is omega s plus omega, omega i plus omega s minus omega p. So from that menu, I just need to find which one is uh, represents each frequency. Very well, then we solve that. The same manipulation as before, you get the couple wave equations. And what is interesting now is, while those terms, remember the phase, cell phase and cross phase modulation, they, they are proportional to AP, this is now proportional to the product fields and the phase factor. And that's very important. Think about this. Let's ignore the other terms. It means that the derivative of the field depends on a number that if delta beta isn't zero, this number is all sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Right? So the, the, the derivative is positive. Sometimes it grows, sometimes it increases, so on and so forth. So we're going to get into this in more detail. So we keep that there and... Uh, I just want to show one thing before we actually try to solve those three couple equations, which is called the manley row relation. Um, look, if we calculate the photon, photon flux at a certain frequency, you can, you can prove the following statement. Uh, let's see how it changes over z. The, the photon flux is just power divided by the frequency, so the, the number of flux divided by the, the number of photons divided by the effective area. So, so how many photons are... Um, flowing through a certain area. And you can prove by using these equations the following, that the number of the changing photon flux at omega p is twice and negative the changing photon flux at omega s and omega i. And that simply represents that two photons that are annihilated here create one photon here and one photon there. Right? So that's why you get this from the um, classical equations, and so the, the total uh, flux is, is conserved. Again, we ignored uh, absorption. Oh well, so let's go and try to solve this. S but of course, we'll make some approximations. The first is that the pump is much stronger, so power that is being carried here and here is, is small. So in the lab, we're talking about if I amplify these guys. This is very strong pump laser. Those are weak. And if they gain power as they propagate, we're still saying they gain power, but not very much, meaning they're still much less than the pump. Okay? If I start getting a lot of power transferred to these guys, then we need to revisit this assumption. It's called um, depleted versus undepleted approximation. Very well, so we do that, um, and uh, we basically, for the pump, we simply assume that we have cell phase modulation, and the, so the solution is what we had already. So the pump, we're saying, it will transfer some power, but it's so little that I'm going to ignore. I'm just going to think that this is propagating as if there was no other laser there, and it only feels its own phase change, um, the cell phase modulation. If I do that, um, Ignore the frequency dependence of gamma. Uh, then we only need to solve two equations now, not three. The pump is already solved. And they have the cross phase modulation, which I have also ignored the cell phase modulation because the pump power is much greater than the others. Right? Same thing. And uh, 
this is easy to solve. Now, uh, all you have to do is to change variables like that to incorporate the uh, cell phase solution that you already know. You have a certain amplitude. And so that they, when you plug this in, you get a linear differential equation with constant coefficients. Did I go too fast on that? Hmm? Nobody wants to say that? So what I did is this. Though the questions are here. This term, I already know what's going to happen. This is cell phase modulation, so that's a phase. So I'm going to put it in. I change variables. Capital A, small a, and the phase. Just do the derivative, substitute, you get those two equations. Now you incorporate the first term into the exponential. And now, from here to here, do the second order derivative here, Deriv derive is again. You're going to have the derivative of AS, which is given here, and it depends on AL. So you plug this in, and you now isolate the equations for ALs for the uh, signal and the idler. And this is a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. And the initial conditions are the amplitude at zero, and then the first order derivative is related by the own, its own equation at zero. That can be solved again. So homework number two, the solution to this. Okay? Make note, huh? Uh, and the solution is ugly, but it's there. And again, we're not gonna, it's there for completeness, but we're just gonna understand now what it means. Um, let's do case one, case two, and case three. Three examples. Look, I have all these terms here, cosine hyperbolic, G is a game parameter that is given by that uh, phase mismatch, the linear phase mismatch that we talked about. This is the delta beta. Let's just keep it in front of us here. Delta beta is beta um, of the signal plus beta of the either minus two beta of the pump. So just give that, keep that in, in front of us. So I have a certain gamma is the nonlinear parameter, P is the pump power. And the amplitude it has a phase factor. Let's not worry about that right now. And two terms. One that depends on the amplitude, its own amplitude at the input, and another that depends on the amplitude of the other wave. Right? So we have three cases here. The first one is there's nothing on this side. So zero right here. So we only have that term. The other ones, we have both, but they are shifted in phase. So two lasers, before I couple them into the fiber, I control the phase of one of them. Let's see what happens. And the third one, which is the experiment you're going to do is, I'm not going to treat lasers, but I'm going to have noise. And we're going to treat noise a little bit special. We're going to say that they have the same power but the phase relationship is random. Okay? So all we do is get that, plug it in here, and see what's going on. So let's see the first one. I'm calling this parametric gain and wavelength conversion. Why is it wavelength conversion? It's simple because we have a wavelength here, we have nothing here, and at the output, I will convert power to this wavelength. So I will have conversion of wavelength. I'll generate Parametric gain is because we will see this amplitude is going to go up as well. Okay? <clears throat> All right, let's see that first case. Whoop. Yep. So now we are in the final part here. So I just took the, the previous formula, put one of them zero, well, the amplitude, the initial amplitude of one of the uh, lasers zero, and you get this expression. And uh, it's interesting that the amplitude of the signal depends on its value at zero, of course, and then that term. But the amplitude of the idler also depends on the amplitude of the signal at zero. So it is generated. That's what it means, right? Very well. So, so this is what I mentioned. And let's see how it is. So if I plot this expression here, the first part is it depends whether G is real or imaginary. So first, just the math part. If this is imaginary, 
this becomes i times sine. This becomes, and it's all, it can only be purely imaginary. So this is i times a number. So i cancels i, the expression is still, still real, uh, and then becomes a sine, oscillatory. But if it's real, then this is a hyperbolic sign, which is pretty much an explanation, right? So the power of the signal and idler at zero, yes, the idler was zero, but then it's get, it gets generated. And then at one, it was a certain number, I'm normalizing by one here, and it gets um, generated as well. So there's a certain gain. And from the expression here, remember what G is. G is what's this thing over here. And, and, and look, there's a positive term and then a negative term. So the maximum G is obviously when the negative term is zero. So delta beta plus two gamma P equals to zero. That is called the phase matching condition. Okay, so mathematically, you know that already. So what, what, what does that mean? It simply means I have a maximum G. So the maximum gain. Look, if this gain is large, hyperbolic sign is just exponential. Right? So it, it grows exponentially. And, and you can calculate that if this condition is right, so this is zero, then G is G zero, two gamma P. And, um, and then these guys just end up like that. So the power is uh, P zero one plus exponential of two gamma P divided by four, exponential gain. Okay, that's the case when I have phase matched fully satisfied maximum parametric gain. Now, what if it's not satisfied? What if I am in a regime where this is delta beta is uh, positive and this term is positive, therefore this is purely imaginary? Then the solutions become simply sign. So instead of increasing exponentially the power of those two sidebands, they do increase, but then they go back and forth. So you get this oscillatory, oscillatory behavior. Along the waveguide, you, you Think about this, you, you have a certain power at the um, signal, nothing at the idler. And then it does increase, so power is flowing from the pump to them. But then eventually it reverts itself. And why does it revert itself? Well, for now, mathematically, remember the term on the right hand side has exponential of i delta beta z. So the phase changed, therefore uh, it was growing, now it's decreasing. Okay, so that's in nonlinear optics phase matching. You're going to hear about that all the time. And in this particular case, you have just learned how it works. On a waveguide, it means I need to have a G real or imaginary. So that condition, delta beta plus 2 gamma P equals to zero, doesn't happen for every frequency. We're going to learn that um, pretty soon. Okay, let's understand now phase matching. We saw from the equations what it means. But let's just have a physical vision for this particular case. All right, send them in. I already know what happens to the pump. It's going to have only a phase factor, the cell phase modulation. And I already know what's going to happen for the signal and either. They, also, they are going to have cross phase modulation created by the pump. And it's twice them. We know that. But we know that at this plane, whatever location you are, you generate a polarization, have the radiation field, and the radiating field is proportional to P3. In this case, 2 omega 1 minus omega 2, you get EP squared, EI, complex conjugate. That's going to be on the same phase as the input signal um, field. Well, let's just plug this in. Right, so I have two EP, so I'm gonna have two gamma P plus two beta P, beta P, it's right here. The two gamma P isn't there, why? Because I have the complex conjugated right here, which is going to cancel to the cross phase modulation right there. So in the end, the radiation field has this phase right there. Exponential of two beta P minus beta I. But the input field has 2 gamma p plus beta s, so the cross phase modulation, but it plus its own propagation constant. Well, these two fields are going to interfere right there. And you only get constructive interference if they have the same phase, right? 
What's the phase difference between this and that? It's exactly the phase matching condition. Two gamma p plus delta beta equal to zero. Right? So the phase matching condition, now, you know what's going on. The fields have a phase that it's not only a linear propagation, but also cross-phase modulation, a linear part. And you need to match whatever is being generated in a certain location with whatever came in. So they, con they, they interfere constructively, and that builds up along the waveguide. Okay? Very well. So the phase sensitive amplification, exactly the same thing. I won't spend much time. You get the equation, and uh, the only difference is we have now uh, a difference propagated on uh, um, the gain depends on the phase difference. And all comes out from the same, um, the same picture because I can adjust the input phase now to control whether I have positive, constructive, and negative interference. And in the lab, we do that assuming those frequencies are stable and another laser control the phase. So uh, how do you control the phase of a laser? What's a very simple way to control the phase? A mirror, right? You move the mirror. Right? It, it, it moves a little bit more over there, or you can use a like a fiber, a lithium niobate modulator, any material that you can change the refractive index. Um, anyway, so that's what you do. And then the gain is something like that. Um, it now, oh, it's a large number, so this is, it was one, right? But it oscillates with the phase difference. So you can have amplification and deamplification and so on and so forth. Okay, so the final example that we have is the modulation stability. So that's an effect. And again, what, what do we have? The scenario is this. I get one laser. I amplify, I don't know if I have a cartoon here or not. No. I amplify that laser so it has a lot of power. And I also have um, a broadband noise. Okay, so you'll see in the lab, get a laser, send it through an airborne doped fiber amplifier. And the airborne doped fiber amplifier, you, you, you amplify that laser, but you also generate um, ASC, so uh, amplified spontaneous emission. So on the laser, you have uh, this, this, this sort of a, a field that are symmetrically distributed here, and I'm assuming they are pretty much flat, so they have about the same power. Uh, but the phase is completely random. It's nice. And so on the previous expression where we had the gain dependent on phase, we average them out simply because when we measure, this is going to be fluctuating and we're going to see an average. So the expression we get is that. <clears throat> Much simpler than before, we have one plus um, the coefficients and again, sine hyperbolic of GZ. Um, exactly the same phase matching condition, right? Because I'm still talking about one frequency here mixing with one Fourier component at omega s and another Fourier component at omega i, symmetrically located. So it's still the two omega one minus omega two process and exactly the same phase matching. So um, the same expressions hold, except there's a factor of two here because the power is one and one, different than what we had before. They are both present at the input. While before we treated the case where one is present, the other one is not. Factor of two shows up. Um, and then, here's what I want to do. I want to know how the gain depends on the frequency separation. What is the spectrum that I'm going to see at the output? This is the spectrum at the input, but I know this is going to have a gain. But are they all going to have the same gain? Or how, I mean, what is the spectrum? That's what we want to know. So let's go back. Here's our, our, our expression for the uh, output power. And you see, gamma is pretty much a parameter. P, the input power. And G depends on delta beta is right here. And delta beta depends on the frequency because it depends on beta S and beta I. So the frequency dependence of the modulation stability spectrum is hidden right here inside delta beta. So I need to know beforehand how beta depends on frequency. How do I know that? By solving the eigenvalue problem, the eigenmodes. And then calculating this. If I know beta, I calculate beta at omega i, beta at, oh, this is supposed to be s, and then minus 2 omega p. 
that difference gives me this term. And if I change omega i and omega s, then this term changes, then g term changes, and then the gain changes. So let's look at an example now. Um, so this is the wave vector of fused silica, for example. Just get glass, pure glass. And it depends on frequency. Um, and, for, and, there, and this is for fused silica, but of course any material is going to have that. And you just solve the waveguide. There's a waveguide contribution. The point is beta depends on frequency. And as I said before, we, frequencies are not really far apart. They're kind of close. So we're going to do a Taylor expansion around the central frequency, which is the pump. right? So I'm going to write that the propagation constant for any frequency close to the pump is just a Taylor expansion around the pump. And beta 1 is the derivative of beta with respect to omega calculated at omega p. Um, beta 2, the second derivative, beta 3, the third, and fourth, etc. So we call these the dispersion parameters. Those are the dispersion parameters, how beta varies with omega at the frequency of the pump laser. So if I change the pump laser, then those coefficients will change. Okay? Um, second and fourth. Oh, now what's interesting here is when you do this separate this um, calculation, so calculate this at omega i, calculate this at omega s, and calculate this the linear phase mismatch. Um, because the frequencies are symmetric with respect to the pump laser, all the um, beta 1, beta 3, beta 4, 5 terms go away, and you only depend on the even terms, beta 2 and beta 4. All right? So far wave mixing does not depend on odd, term, odd dispersion coefficients, only on, uh, I mean, um, the generate far wave mixing with uh, the chi tree medium. Only the... Uh, beta 2, beta 4, etc. So if I want to know how the spectrum changes, I need to calculate beta 2 and beta 4. I need to know, is this positive? Is this negative? Is it bigger one on the other? How is this? And here's an example. So this is an image of uh, a silicon waveguide. So, so the cross-section image is here. So you cut a waveguide like that. It's sort of a rectangle, rectangular shape, where this is silicon and this is silica. What you see here is the uh, field distribution. You see it's pretty much linear. It's not really Gaussian. It has this, this discontinuity of the field over here. So, so this is the field distribution, the eigenmode that we talked about. And uh, you can calculate the beta and then effect. Um, do the derivatives and then calculate the beta 2 and beta 4. So this is beta 2. And I'm varying here the width, just how wide it is. And so you see beta 2 is negative, and then it crosses at 0, and then becomes positive. And if I change the width, I can shift where the 0 is. Right? So for example, well, the, the nomenclature here is um, when beta 2 is positive, we call this normal dispersion. And when beta 2 is negative, we call this dispersion. Just keep in mind. So this is called a dispersion engineering. So you change the geometry to change beta. The other thing you can see, how about beta 4? Here's another example. This chart shows beta 2, which is actually on the, uh, sorry, on the um, left hand um, axis. So again, here's the zero. Here's the zero dispersion wavelength, where beta 2 is zero. To this side, beta 2 is negative. To this side, beta 2 is positive. And this is the wavelength of the pump. So where do I put my pump? By playing where I put the pump, I can have anomalous dispersion, beta 2 negative, beta 2 positive. Um, and what about beta 4? Beta 4 in this particular case is always positive, you see? It doesn't cross 0. So I have to now plug these numbers in the uh, delta beta and then see what we get. And you get something like this. So this, this figure is the gain. I just did this. Um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to write here. So um, G in dB is 
tan log tan of p at z divided by p at zero. Okay, so it's how much it was amplified in logarithm scale. And um, let's read this chart. <clears throat> this, the zero, is my pump laser. This is the frequency shift between the pump and um, where the frequency I'm, I'm, I'm measuring the gain. Um, and so if we, and, and the color scale is the gain, as I mentioned, in dB. And this is the wavelength of the pump. So what I'm doing is I'm going from normal to anomalous dispersion, so changing beta 2 from um, positive to negative, and beta 4 is always negative. That's always positive in that case, but it changes the value, right? And you have this shape. Let's see if we can understand that. Let's, here's lambda zero. And let's look at this position, for example, where lambda p is about 1400. And what I'm plotting here is this. The phase matching condition, remember, delta beta plus two gamma p must be zero. So my, I'll just pass this to the right hand side, minus two gamma p, that's the red line right there. And then the blue line is the linear phase mismatch. Now, we are in the anomalous dispersion. So beta 2 is a parabola looking down, so like that. Then I'm adding beta 4, but beta 4 is positive. So eventually beta 4 dominates and it goes back up, right? So it crosses the minus 2 gamma p here, 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 and here. So here I have perfect phase matching. And so you just look at the gain. So that's the, the, a cut of the gain. And you see four peaks, one, two, three, four, each of which corresponding to the positions where you have perfect phase matching, right? So this is pretty much the uh, signal, the gain signal due to beta four, and this is due to beta two. Okay, make sense? Now, well, let's look another one like this. Let's cut over here. What happened is I'm getting closer to the zero dispersion wavelength. Therefore, beta two is almost zero, but not zero yet. So this is almost zero. You see the parabola here opening? And then beta four goes there. And as a result, the position in which beta four crosses wasn't that far away. It comes closer to the laser, right? So the peaks are now closer. Therefore, I can use this process to tune where I want to generate the signal. By pumping the laser, I can tune how far I generate the beta 4 peaks. And then let's look at the normal dispersion regime. At the normal dispersion regime, um, they are both positive. So delta beta is always positive. So there is no phase matching. There is no peak anywhere except at zero. If you look at the number at zero, it's about five, it's never as large as what we had before. So if I increase the pump power, this peak go up exponentially. This does not go exponentially, it goes up quadratically. Okay? So, we could uh, do a case where beta four is zero, we would not have those curves, becomes um, uh, only dependent on beta two. Uh, we could perhaps find another waveguide where beta 4 is negative, and then the peaks will turn down instead of up. So that's kind of dispersion engineering to have different uh, curves. And to close, this is a measurement of that. So uh, what I have here, here's a noise level, and I'm just tuning the pump laser to different uh, lasers. And lambda zero, this is an optical fiber. It's 1549, so like somewhere over here. So you can see the transition from where you have the peak to where you have no peak, but just use auxiliary. So in the hands-on, you have this is what you're gonna measure. And then the question, another question here is, okay, if I get the spectrum, can I now use this method to measure what the dispersion is and what the nonlinear coefficient is? Okay, you can. And then I wanna uh, the third question here is get the, the expressions for the gain and work them out, 
see how you would uh, how you would measure this, how you would measure beta two and how you would measure gamma, and get ready for the uh, hands-on experiment. All right? I know everybody's hungry, and I've talked for two hours, so that's all I have. Questions? I'll be around as well, but um, that's all I have for today. Good. Okay.